<laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, when we look at the uh, important developments of the uh, past 40 years, uh, perhaps most people in here, and I hope you also agree with me, that one of the most important developments is the rise of China, the economic ascent of China since 1980. Uh, under a single party uh, government, political stability and substantial economic reforms allowed China to enjoy high growth rates of about 8 to 10 percent per year for several decades. And it's now emerged as a major uh, center for manufacturing, the largest trade partner of many countries in the world, and um, a very influential member of the global community. Could you speak a little louder or use a microphone, please? I, um, I will try my best. I don't think you can use a microphone because it doesn't exist. Is this helpful no, 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 at all? Working. It's not working? No, 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 I'll not try working. to speak louder. Right. Yes. Um, For the first two decades of its uh, ascent, since 1980, China was primarily focused on developing its own economy and infrastructure, and liberal economic policies allowed China to attract considerable amount of investment from um, industrial countries, the in United States in particular, but more recently, ever since year 2000, China itself has accumulated significant amount of savings as a result of its successful trade and export policy, and it has started to become a major investor in other economies, and it has now become the, one of the strongest, the strongest advocates of economic globalization. At a time when European countries and United States have expressed doubts about the benefits of uh, globalization, uh, China has emerged as its strongest advocate. And the current president of China, President Xi Jinping, uh, has really invested his uh, political fortune in promotion of a globalization program called the New Silk Road Economic Initiative. And he has, ever since he was um, appointed or elected as pres president of China in 2012, has been an advocate, and he has been a successful advocate of this initiative. He presented his idea for the first time for this uh, program in a visit to Kazakhstan, the capital of Astana. Um, and in this visit, he focused on the economic belt, meaning the land route that he said would connect China to Central Asia and Europe and Middle East. Um, in addition to the economic benefits of this cooperation, we also saw the geopolitical and security benefits. And I'd like to quote him in the speech that he delivered in Nazarbayev University in Astana. He said, um, joint efforts, what are some of the objectives of what he is proposing? joint efforts to crack down on the three evil forces of terrorism, extremism, and separatism, as well as drug trafficking and transnational organized crime. So it was a global initiative which was broader than just pure economic policy. And of course, the Nazarbayev University is named after President of Kazakhstan, um, President uh, Nur Sultan Nazarbayev, who liked the idea and offered him a robe, a beautiful hat, and a picture frame, also known as a, an honorary doctorate. Uh, a month after proposing this idea for the economic belt, President Xi, that you see here, visited Indonesia. And in his visit to Indonesia, in an address to the parliament of Indonesia in Jakarta, he <clears throat> proposed the maritime silk road, in addition to the belt road that is, uh, that is a land connection from China to Europe, he proposed the creation of a maritime silk road, meaning development of the infrastructure to facilitate maritime sea trade among the countries of Asia, Middle East, going through Mediterranean to Europe, and also reaching to the uh, eastern coasts of Africa. 
And in, in addition to that, in this same meeting, you proposed for the creation of the financial institution equivalent to World Bank called the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, or AIIB, so that members of this bank would contribute money and also receive loans from this institution to develop the infrastructure to facilitate trade uh, and develop the required structure, infrastructure for both the land connection and the steel connections of the Silk Road project. So what are the objectives of this initiative? The, the purpose of the Silk Road project is to primarily focus on transportation infrastructure among these countries so, and also expand economic capacity uh, so that they can facilitate trade and investment. The financial arm of this uh, uh, proposal is the AIIB, the investment bank that I mentioned, and also two other banking institutions of China. And China pledged that it would provide the financing and assist these uh, countries who are interested in joining the Belt and Road Initiative to develop their infrastructure. Um, China proposed this as a what is called a win-win development strategy. The, the word win-win development phrase uh, comes up frequency, frequently when uh, Chinese officials uh, speak about the Silk Road Initiative. Over time, as you can see now, there is this map shows the belt in yellow and the maritime silk road in green. And you can see that it really covers many countries, as many as 65 countries would be affected by the uh, belt and road initiative. And over time, the name has changed. Initially, it was called Silk Road, but Chinese government decided that that might be too China-centric, so they changed it to one belt and one road. And then oh, it was over time clear that this is more than just a single belt and a single route, so they changed it to belt and road. The latest name for this initiative now is called belt and road. So um, we need to clarify what this project is and what it's, it's not. Um, because some people compare it to World Trade Organization or the Trans-Pacific Partnership. The Belt and Road is not a multilateral economic agreement, uh, such as World Trade Organization. Instead, it is a collection of bilateral agreements so far, primarily between China and all other partners. And uh, its uh, financial arm, as I mentioned, are AAIB and China's Import and Export Bank, and China has also established a fund called the Silk Road Fund for this purpose. The Asian Infrastructure and Investment Bank was proposed in 2013. It was created in January 2016, and already many countries have joined. So the world community has responded positively to this initiative. Here you see the contributions of China itself as the largest contributor, 32% of the fund. Uh, total value of this fund is 93 billion. Uh, and you see the contribution of members' countries. Uh, you need to be a member in order to borrow money. And already several countries in Southeast Asia and also Egypt have received funding from this uh, initiative. It also has several um, European members. Uh, as of now, there are 58 members and 22 prospective members that are looking to join. This is the latest statistics for 2017. And this map also shows the countries that have joined the, the AIIB, and it also shows the multiple, multiple roads and connections that are proposed uh, uh, by this initiative. As you can see, it connects China to Siberia. It has uh, one path to uh, Northern Europe, <coughs> to um, Russia, and another path, actually two paths 
that come down into Middle East. One of them is the uh, path that, as you can see, uh, goes through Turkmenistan, Kazakhstan, uh, comes into Iran. From Iran, it goes to Turkey, and also there is a branch that goes into Syria and Iraq. Uh, another important one is the uh, connection through Pakistan. It's called the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. There's also a chip here. The project itself is taken very seriously by China. Uh, if you travel by China, China's airlines, any of them, uh, you see in their entertainment programs, several programs, and I had the opportunity to watch them. They are very entertaining. Um, I briefly visited China, and when I turned the television, I saw several programs focusing on Silk and Road, because of the map, at least I was able to recognize it, although I do not uh, understand Chinese. And Chinese institutions between 2013 and December of 2016 have hosted a thousand conferences and seminars about the Belt and Road Initiative. So China is really pushing very strongly, both in terms of financing and public relations to promote this uh, initiative. Uh, the latest development with respect to this project was the economic uh, forum, the Belt and Road Forum that took place in May of 2017. And you might recognize some of the um, participants. Uh, in this uh, gathering, 29 presidents or prime ministers attended. And uh, there, are, there is some dispute as far as exactly how many uh, countries sent representatives, something between 70 to 100 countries participated in this uh, forum that was intended to promote the program. And also during this forum, many bilateral um, agreements were also signed uh, between the participants and China primarily. And just to point out the significance of what we're talking about in terms of rise of China, the graph that you observe here shows the GDP of the, uh, of, United, of the United States and China. This is adjusted for price differences in terms of difference in purchasing power and inflation. And as you can see, China took over as the largest economy, it caught up with the United States in 2014, and it is projected that it would grow and become the largest global economy. It is already the largest economy, but Chinese themselves don't like to brag about that. And often they refer to themselves as the second largest uh, economy. Um, the, again, the emphasis here is really on global cooperation. And when you look at Chinese literature, they try to differentiate between what they are trying to going to do in terms of engagement with global community and how it is different uh, from or distinct from the engagement of Europeans. They emphasize words like non-exploitation, non anti-colonialism, the words that were frequently heard during, uh, uh, before 1980 during Mao Zedong's rule in concerns about uh, being a member of developing board and uh, sort of affiliating with developing countries and their concerns about uh, anti-colonialism. So um, now I'd like to talk about why China is interested in this initiative. What are some of the uh, specific benefits for China? Uh, first of all, when we look at the Chinese economic success, up until a few years ago, it was primarily focused on domestic development, um, investment in housing, infrastructure, manufacturing, allowed China to achieve uh, this high growth rate on an annual basis. But now they have developed uh, excess capacity in engineering, in manufacturing. Therefore, in order to sustain this uh, rapid economic growth, uh, China is looking abroad, to find new markets abroad, uh, both in infrastructure so that they can create jobs for Chinese uh, corporations, and also developing markets for Chinese products. So the Belt and Road Initiative uh, serves that important uh, objective. 
Another important goal is to develop the western region of China. So, so, so far, the economic development of China has primarily focused on southeast China and eastern regions of China. The western region, especially the province of Xinjiang, I hope I pronounced the name correctly, uh, or have not been as developed as the eastern part. There has been a migration of population to eastern region for manufacturing. Now, both for environmental reasons and in order to develop the western regions, China is looking at the economic belt as an efficient way of promoting manufacturing in the western regions. The, the region, the province of Xinjiang is also uh, predominantly a Muslim region. That is the region where Uyghurs are connected, uh, are, are placed, they, they live there. But the region itself is very large. The size is about three times the size of France, four times the size of California, but its population is only 23 million. So there is room for activity and expansion of that region. China hopes that economic development in its western region would also uh, reduce the tendency toward Islamic militancy and desire for separatism. So they consider these as benefits. Now, in terms of trade and transport of goods and services, um, clearly rail transport and road transport by trucks, which is what China is trying to develop in the economic belt, are not as cost effective as uh, maritime sea transport. If you are transporting goods from eastern China, for example, from Fuzhou. But if you have manufacturing and production in western China, you would see that it is cost effective to transport it to Central Asia and Middle East and even Europe by land rather than transport it by land to the seaports in eastern China and then transport it by sea. So the location of western China being so close to Central Asia and Middle East is itself an, a very important factor. Another important contribution of Belt and Road Project is that it reduces China's vulnerability to American military presence in Asia. Uh, America enjoys a significant military, uh, especially naval supremacy compared to China's military capacities at present. And uh, there are several choke points where American military can affect the flow of goods to and from China. One of them is the Malacca Strait in Malaysia, as you can see one of the roads goes through there. And the other one is of course Persian Gulf. Uh, so in order to reduce the vulnerability of China's trade in both energy and flow of goods, China is providing these land connections from various parts of Asia and Middle East to the western part of China. So this is, it has significant strategic value in that sense. And of course, global influence. China is now presenting itself as the leader of uh, globalization. Uh, there is now a new term called geodevelopmentalism, uh, a strategy of uh, establishing influence and connection through development projects with infrastructure and uh, helping with economic capacity. So all of these are significant benefits that China can expect from uh, developing this program. But now let's move to Middle East. What is China's interest in Middle East specifically? Uh, the primary interest is in energy. China became dependent on imported uh, natural gas and oil ever since 1993. Um, before then it was self-sufficient. And look at how consumption of energy has grown compared to domestic production. It's therefore China <coughs> needs to import in order to secure energy in the long run. China is looking at Middle East, especially Persian Gulf, as a major source of uh, crude oil and natural gas. The uh, Middle East is home to about two-thirds of proven reserves of oil and natural gas, especially Persian Gulf, which accounts for something about 
50%. Therefore, uh, it is quite logical for China, as, a, as currently the largest consumer of crude oil, to look at the Middle East. Inside the Middle East, GCC is the most important region, just as it is for the United States, and China's largest partners are Iran and Saudi Arabia, which count for 25% of oil and natural gas imports of China at present. Uh, so this is the reason <coughs> I mentioned of why China is interested in the Middle East and bringing it into the Belt and Road. Of course, China's relations with the Middle East are not going to begin moving forward. They have already developed ever since 2012. Um, uh, I'm sorry, ever since the year 2000 in particular. Uh, another reason is that Middle East is becoming a major uh, export market for China. Uh, the rise in price of oil ever since the year 2000 has increased the income and the uh, savings of Middle Eastern countries. China is interested in attracting um, savings of oil exporting countries for investment in China. And as you can see, trade between China and the uh, Middle East has increased significantly. <coughs> the only reason you see a decline after year 2014 is that price of oil decline. So you see a sharp decline in, um, imports, uh, in uh, imports and also uh, because the, um, the oil exporting countries had less money, <coughs> declining in China's export to the region. Nevertheless, China is now a major partner for many Middle Eastern countries. As you can see here, in year 2000, just to see how China's role in the global economy has changed, in year 2000, only five countries uh, counted China as their largest trading partners, partner in terms of volume of exports and imports. But in year 2016, more than 100 countries globally from Australia to the United States are con considered China as their largest trade partner. In the Middle East, as you can see here, many, for many countries by 2016, China has become either the largest or the second or the third largest uh, trade partner and the top in uh, eight countries, uh, there are eight, um, represent the oil exporting countries. Many of them have special security relations with the United States, but China has replaced the United States and Europe as the largest trade partner for these countries. Even Israel, as you see, for Israel, China is Chinese aid. Um, an important trade partner. And to go into a little bit more details about where China stands, here is the value of bilateral trade, which is the sum of exports and imports um, for 2014. And you can see that for many countries, uh, again, the city significance of China in comparison with the United States. It's, the, I think, the only countries that the uh, U.S. has a larger share of uh, trade or a larger volume of trade are uh, Kuwait and Israel. Okay. Now, China itself, in uh, engaging with the Middle East, uh, has tried to uh, set priorities for how it wants to engage. And it has welcomed uh, interactions, many... Uh, Diplomatic visits have taken place. There are regular diplomatic visits between Arab leaders and China. There is something called um, Arab-China Economic Forum. Um, and President Xi um, has proposed a program called One, Two, Three, a strategic plan. It says the first priority is energy cooperation in both sides. China is investing in um, upstream and development of um, oil and natural gas. And some Arab countries, especially from the Gulf Cooperation Council, countries like Saudi Arabia and Kuwait and United Arab Emirates, are investing in China in what is known as downstream for refining crude oil into um, refined uh, fuels, uh, gasoline, jet fuel, heating oil, for sale inside China. 
And then number two represents trade and investment, focusing on developing those. And number three uh, says that China is interested in targeting three specific uh, industries, uh, nuclear energy, aerospace technology, and uh, energy, new, new renewable energies, not just focusing on oil, but because these countries have shown interest in solar energy, China has made significant advances in uh, solar energy technology and uh, it's proposing to cooperate with them on both nuclear and solar and other types of uh, renewable forms of uh, energy. Um, relations with other Middle Eastern countries uh, such as uh, Iran, uh, Israel and Turkey have uh, developed significantly. Um, Iran not only is China the largest uh, partner for Iran, but Iran is crucial as a transit route for the um, Belt and Road project for connecting the Central Asia to Turkey. This is not the only route, but this is the most efficient route as far as uh, transporting goods and services. And also, uh, I'd like to mention that China is um, looking at this Belt and Road initiative not just for transport of goods, but also for cultural exchange and promotion of people to people uh, travel and tourism as well. So they are developing high-speed uh, railroads. Uh, China has made significant progress in that. Uh, right now in Iran, several projects are underway uh, to uh, prepare the infrastructure for Iran's railroad system so that high-speed railroads can go through Iran both east and east and western direction. Um, another important country for China is Israel, not for energy, but uh, China is interested in Israel as a source of innovation and technology. And uh, they are, in their negotiations with Israel, they always uh, propose that if you give us technologies that we are interested in, um, for example, advanced military technology, uh, agricultural technology, we would be happy to invest in China. And they um, uh, also, I'd like to mention that uh, there is this uh, belief in China that uh, um, Jews are extremely smart and they have a very successful family culture. So several books have been published in China by experts on the Middle East about trying to explain why Israel is so successful and why the Jews in the United States are so successful. They, they think that there is something in uh, Jewish culture that could benefit China. So there is that cultural interest in Israel as well. And there is also interest in Turkey. Um, Turkey is a major importer of uh, Chinese goods. And uh, China is also interested in Turkey because of the influence that Turkey can have in the Muslim population of Xinjiang. Uh, in Xinjiang, the separatists call themselves uh, East Turkestan because of their connection to uh, their cultural and historical connections. And that is a factor that through expansion of trade with uh, Turkey, uh, China is trying to sort of uh, solicit the assistance of the uh, Turkish government in trying to pacify and prevent militancy in its own um, the Western province, which has a large Muslim population. So, we talked about China's interest in Middle East. Now let's talk about why Middle East is interested in um, trading with China. And, why. and this relationship has been two-sided. There is a, a, one could say, a mutual attraction between Middle East and China. One reason is that while there is a lot of historical tension because of colonialism between Middle East and Europe, and more recently uh, between Middle East and the United States, uh, the two regions have uh, lived their separate lives for nearly three, four centuries, and there is no historical baggage. So they, they are, they have, it's as if they've rediscovered each other as potential partners. Um, not only China is interested in Middle Eastern oil, but Middle Eastern oil exporters are interested in China as a reliable partner. Because imports of oil by United States and by Europe have declined in the past decade. 
U.S. is now becoming practically self-sufficient. But on the other hand, China's demand is expected to continue. And while the United States encourages these oil exporting countries to trade their oil in the market without long-term contracts, China welcomes long-term contracts. China signed an agreement with Iran for 25 years. <coughs> Um, another agreement with Saudi Arabia for 20 years. So these long-term contracts mean that exporters of oil in the region can have a secure uh, market for their uh, energy exports. And that is one of the reasons for, the, um, for this mutual attraction. Um, after year 2000, we have also noticed that uh, some of these countries that have good relations with the United States, security relations, when they want to influence the U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East and they feel frustrated, they signal to the United States that if you don't give us what we want, we can turn look east and look at China. And this happened in the uh, early 2000s when tensions between U.S. and um, Saudi Arabia were high after September 11. Um, and also when Middle Eastern countries don't get what they want in terms of weapons, they sort of use China as a bargaining chip to send signals. Another uh, unique feature of Chinese foreign policy that makes it attractive to Middle Eastern countries is non-interference. China believes that every country should uh, pursue its own path of political and economic development, and countries should not interfere in each other's domestic effects, especially in, with respect to promoting democracy and human rights. And that is really a, a position that many Middle Eastern countries, such as Iran, Saudi Arabia, like, and they appreciate that non-interference. Um, Some countries have tried or have um, assumed that they can use China as a strategic partner um, against the United States or against other rivals, their rivals in the region. Uh, but they have realized uh, over time that China is not interested in developing military alliances. China is interested in maintaining geopolitical neutrality and developing economic relations. So, um, although in the future perhaps something like a strategic alliances might emerge, so far China has tried to uh, remain neutral in many of the, uh, with response to these uh, requests. For example, Iran has tried to offer trade incentives to China in order to um, discourage China from cooperating with uh, international sanctions but these have only been partially successful. And finally, in the final years of the sanctions against Iran because of its nuclear program in 2013-2014, China fully cooperated with the international community and the United Nations against Iran. So uh, that strategic partnership has not been realized. Um, however, what is unique about Middle East in addition to being a major source of energy, and is, we don't observe that in other regions such as Central Asia or Southeast Asia, is that Middle East is uh, currently experiencing many conflicts. We have the conflict between Iran and the United States. We have the uh, uh, conflict between Iran and Saudi Arabia. Uh, we have the Arab-Israeli conflict that has been ongoing. And most recently, the, the tensions between uh, Qatar and other uh, oil exporting countries in the uh, Persian Gulf, Saudi Arabia, and the United Arab Emirates. So um, China is trying to approach the region despite these ongoing conflicts. Another unique feature of Middle East is that uh, the, United, the United States dominates Middle East militarily more than any other region. So China's entry into the Middle East takes place in the shadow of U.S. military dominance. If you look at a map of, United, of the Middle East, there are many countries where the uh, United States maintains uh, 
military bases, Bahrain, Qatar, United Arab Emirates, or just until a few years ago in uh, Saudi Arabia. So U.S. military presence is a fact that China has, except, and if we look at you, we can see again uh, this condition. This means that in trying to integrate uh, the Middle East in it can be a Belt and Road Initiative, uh, China faces a number of uh, geopolitical challenges, which it does not face in other regions uh, that are con going to be connected to the Belt and Road. And China's response to these challenges has been to uh, has been two types of response. One of them is that China is maintaining geopolitical neutrality with respect to the ongoing conflicts, and in response to uh, heavy American military domination of Persian Gulf and Indian Ocean and also Pacific Ocean, uh, China is creating multiple links to the Middle East. Not just one link, but multiple links. Because having multiple links means that you can adjust your trade to internal conflicts and also shield your trade against um, a US, potential U.S. Uh, economic black. As you can see here, here's the um, example of multiple links that are being created. And when we look at what is going on in the Persian Gulf, the, the link that's really uh, very crucial for success of China's initiative in the Middle East is the corridor that connects Western China to, through Pakistan to the Arabian Sea. Uh, it's the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor or CPAC, also known as CPAC. Um, so the, the significance of CPAC, I think, this is my own perception, and I welcome any uh, feedback from you, uh, is that it allows China to address the conflicts between Iran and uh, Saudi Arabia. Because uh, Saudi Arabia and its uh, allies in the GCC would, would be hesitant to trade with China and let their goods go through Iran. And there is no uh, prospect of uh, perhaps uh, improvement of relations between Iran and Saudi Arabia. So Saudis have been a strong advocates of developing the, the trade route that goes through Pakistan, connects Pakistan to uh, Western China. That has been, a, I think, one of the uh, elements that, to me, indicates that there has been some intelligent design behind uh, China's initiative when it comes to uh, Middle East. Here is the Pakistan, as you can see. The corridor connects the city of Kashgar in Xinjiang uh, to the uh, port of Gawada. China has signed a contract with Pakistan that uh, uh, allows China to use this port after it's developed for about 30 years. Um, China has announced that this is primarily for economic activities, but uh, once it's developed, it would also have, uh, I believe, it could serve as a military base at some point if necessary. And China is investing heavily in development of energy sources because Pakistan suffers considerable amount of uh, energy shortage, especially electricity. So uh, although this has caused some tension um, uh, between uh, China and India, but China is very committed and already many projects are underway uh, as far as uh, I think about $40 billion is already committed to China's uh, development. Uh, so here you can see the two paths that connect Middle East to the um, Belt and Road. One of them goes through Iran from Bandar Abbas, and now uh, Iran is trying to develop another port called Chabahar. And as you can see, it goes all the way north, connects to Turkmenistan, and then to Kazakhstan. So that's for Iran, and the other one is for Saudi Arabia, going through Pakistan. And here you can see these very happy leaders of the three countries. They gathered in December of 2014 to celebrate the first 
uh, uh, rail transport uh, among their countries. And this is now operational, going north-south. So this is one of the components of the uh, Belt and Road Initiative, not only east and west routes, but also north and south. And it is said that this uh, new project reduces the transport route by 600 kilometers between Iran and Kazakhstan. When it goes north into Kazakhstan, it will connect to the east-west belt. So this is uh, really important for the region's uh, connectivity. Already, uh, Kazakhstan is using this to export uh, wheat and other agricultural products to Iran, and then export from Iran in the uh, Persian Gulf to other regions. And, uh, But this has provoked a response by India, which again is going to benefit Iran, because uh, um, first of all, India objects to the uh, China-Pakistan initiative, because it goes through Kashmir, which is a disputed region. And also, India has been hesitant to join the uh, Belt and Road initiative. It's now trying to develop another route, north-south, connecting uh, India to Russia, which reduces the transport uh, time and transport distance significantly for India to connect to uh, Eastern Europe and Russia. Um, now let's talk about um, China's geopolitical neutrality. What does that mean? It means that China is maintaining a balance between relations with Iran and uh, Saudi Arabia. These two leaders would never uh, agree to meet each other at least at this at present, but uh, during a visit to the region, uh, Chinese leader President Xi met with both of them and he even offered to mediate. But China never goes beyond offering to mediate, it does not take side in these disputes. And here is another one. Uh, at the same time that uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu went to, uh, to a, for a visit to China, during the same week, although the Chinese government announced that they were completely independent. Uh, the Prime Minister of the Palestinian Authority also was there for another visit, within the same one week. But that's not all. Even Tiny Qatar, this is the new leader of Qatar. Uh, his father was very overweight, but he himself is very fit, as you can see. This is the new leader of Qatar, and uh, China, despite the fact that Saudi Arabia is the most important partner of China in the Middle East. China has been uh, friendly with Qatar as well. And China has even used its influence in Pakistan because of the CPAC to discourage Pakistan from even siding with uh, Saudi Arabia too much on this issue and on many issues. So we see that economic influence that China has in the Middle Eastern countries is also um, translated into uh, diplomatic uh, influence. Okay, now uh, United States. I think this is important because uh, what uh, the relations between China and Middle Eastern countries uh, are really uh, influenced by the behavior of United States and also the behavior of Russia. There is a significant difference between the U.S. approach and China's approach uh, to the region. Um, if you become an ally of the United States, the United States will protect you. But of course, the United States is not very popular because of the uh, many dimensions of its policy. But China is friendly with everyone, but no one can count on China in the internal conflicts. So you cannot really use your trade relations with China as a leverage to influence them. Now, also, Russia's relations with the United States and China, uh, with uh, both US and China, affects what China can do in the region. For example, in the uh, Syrian conflict, um, Russia, as you know, has come to the assistance of the Syrian leader. Uh, China has been implicitly supportive of that initiative recently, and now China is negotiating with Syria for reconstruction of Syria uh, moving forward, because the conflict is uh, relatively subsiding. Um, here is an, an, an aspect of the Belt and Road Initiative that might become ge geopolitically sensitive. 
uh, the, the route that comes to Iran is now, not only goes to Turkey, but uh, China is considering connecting that to Syria going to Iraq. So this is going to have an impact on geopolitical conditions of the region because this means that the connectivity between, uh, among Iraq, Iraq and Syria will be strengthened. Therefore, Iran's influence in the, in the region, the, the, what is known as Shiite Crescent, would be strengthened and um, I assume that the United States and Saudi Arabia are likely to respond to, to this, uh, this development. And we'll see whether China is willing to, uh, to modify this based on uh, U.S. concerns or U.S. Uh, pressure. Um, so uh, now, can I'd you like say to... a word about what we're saying here? Pardon? Can you say a word about what we're saying here? What, what you're seeing here is one of the ideas that have been developed for uh, developing uh, both uh, railroad and road connections going from Iran to Iraq, from Iraq to Syria, all the way to the Mediterranean. And some of the names you see here, such as Deir Zor and Rafah, are associated with the conflict with the Islamic State. So this is not uh, something that's present now, but it's one of the proposals for one of the routes that connects the Middle East to the, um, to, to the Belt and Road Initiative. So this is suggested by the Chinese or by the locals? No, no, no. This is suggested by Chinese and their advocates in Europe. There is an institute called the Schiller Institute, which is uh, very much close to China. There is a man named La Rouge, who has been an, a, a strong advocate of uh, China-European connections, and this was proposed by their institution. But Chinese have also talked about it. There have been comments about it in Chinese media as well. Okay. So now let me, um, so this is what uh, the project is and its uh, connection to the Middle East, but I'd like to talk about a number of concerns that the project has raised both internationally and also in the Middle East. So um, uh, there, there is concern that this project might face opposition internally. Because what is, uh, what is it in terms of financial dimension? China is spending significant amount of financial resources as loans and investments in other countries. And many of them are loans, and these countries are, ex are expected to pay it back, but they are risky loans, both geopolitical risks, and what if these economies are not able to pay it back? So uh, some uh, people inside China are saying, why are we spending so much of our resources abroad when there are many needs inside the country? So there is this possibility of both nationalism and concern for financial risk might, might affect. Now, President Xi was reappointed for five more years, and I think he is so powerful now that he perhaps will continue the project for next five years. And by then, the commitment is so large that it might be very costly for uh, China to, to withdraw from it. So that's one concern. Another concern is that uh, when China offers these loans, one of the conditions is that it, it, it should be, the project should have a significant involvement by Chinese companies. So the amount of jobs created locally are limited because those companies then want to create jobs for Chinese employees. There are about half a million Chinese already in the Middle East, about 300,000 of them just in United Arab Emirates, which is a major hub for production and distribution to other parts of the region. So there is question of how will this um, participation um, contribute to the uh, local economy. That some have said uh, our development priorities in developing countries is to focus on perhaps healthcare, um, manufacturing development inside, but the projects that China is interested in supporting are primarily concerned with promoting economic relations with China. So that has been another uh, uh, concern. But there is also a concern specifically to the Middle East that how will the United States respond to this rapid uh, entry of China in the region. Uh, some uh, authors have called uh, Persian Gulf America's oil leak, 
and the American really dominance militarily. But America provides security, and then these countries that receive American security are trading with China. So uh, perhaps there might be some concern there. Uh, and also, uh, what if tensions between China and the United States in other parts of the in, in South um, China Sea, for example, uh, have the spill of an effect on how the United States will use the Persian Gulf uh, as a tool for pressuring uh, China. So that also creates a concern to be, uh, to be dealt with, to be taken into account. Uh, so these are some of the concerns. The project, I think, is a uh, positive project that will affect the globe and Middle East. Already China is a major player. And I'd like to just uh, show you a picture, a historical picture of that uh, the shares of the global economy over time, this goes back to uh, many years, about 2,000 years. And um, although we now talk about the rise of China, uh, one could think that it is the rise of Europe that has been an exception. Because China, if you look at this path, has been a major uh, economy, the almost largest economy, all the way till uh, 1800. So the, as we can see, the red portion that shows the share of China which is rising, it's just restoring China to where it has been historically, not that China is a rising power that uh, was not there before. But if, uh, if this is a little unsettling, let me just finish by showing you the original Silk Road, and I think we all owe something to this creature, this, uh, the Silk Road itself, who, really has made a significant contribution to this concept. If it wasn't for these uh, insects, the Silk Road perhaps would have had another name. So thank you, and I'll be happy to take questions.